Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our conversation today with Secretary of Homeland Security, Jay Johnson, and our Duke professor, David Schanzer. I'm Marty Dempsey, recently retired Army General Officer, 18th Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, but more important, a David Rubenstein Fellow here at Duke University. Before I introduce our two guests, our thanks to the sponsors of this event. Obviously, we couldn't do what we do to bring thought leaders and, and those who are leaders of consequence together without our sponsors. They include the Duke American Grand Strategy Program, the Triangle Center on Terrorism and Homeland Security, the, St the Sanford School of Public Policy, the Political Science Department, and the Triangle Institute, Institute for Security Studies. There are several other great learning opportunities coming up through this forum over the next few months. Please watch out for them, and I encourage you to continue to participate in them. I'll first introduce Professor David Schanzer, Associate Professor and Director of the Triangle Center on Terrorism and Homeland Security at Duke. Before coming to Duke, he served as Minority Staff Director for the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Homeland Security, Legislative Director for Senator Gene Carnahan, Special Counsel with the DOD and Counsel to Senators Joe Biden and William S. Cohen. He's the author of two National Institute of Justice studies, one on using community policing strategies to prevent violent extremism, and the other uh, on anti-terror lessons of Muslim Americans. And now Secretary, well, give him a round of applause. How about we do that? You guys really packed them in, by the way. This is pretty, this is impressive. Secretary of Homeland Security, Jay Johnson. Jay Charles Johnson is, quite simply, a great public servant. He's a civil and criminal uh, trial lawyer, and since 2013, he has served as the nation's fourth Secretary of Homeland Security. Prior to becoming Secretary of Homeland Security, he was the General Counsel of the Department of Defense from 2009 until 2012. He's a graduate of Morehouse College and Columbia Law School, and is the grandson of sociologist and Fisk University president, Dr. Charles Johnson. The Jay Johnson I have come to know and respect has broad, strong shoulders, thick skin, a remarkable intellect, quick wit, and a genuine passion for his country and its values. He is a leader among leaders, and he knows how to build teams. His portfolio as Secretary of Homeland Security requires him to develop relationships and to build trust among numerous federal, state, and local agencies. And in my judgment, he has done that better than anyone I've seen in these last six, 15 years since the attacks of 9-11. Among the issues Secretary Johnson has managed during his tenure are the summer influx of immigrant children in 2014, the fall of 2014 Ebola crisis, the TSA Manning shortfalls of 2016, and I'm sure none of you uh, actually experienced that, the recapitalization of the United States Coast Guard, and of course, the persistent threat of terrorism. It's worth noting that when he came on board as Secretary of Homeland Security at the end of 2013, half of the senior management positions in the department were vacant, the morale of the organization was low, and the department had a reputation as a difficult partner within the United States government interagency. Jay Johnson changed that. Secretary Johnson is married to Susan Maureen DeMarco, who has recently, well, actually not so recently, retired as a dentist. The couple grew up across the street from each other in Wappingers Falls, New York. They have two children, Natalie and Jay Jr. Please welcome Secretary Johnson. Thank you, General Dempsey, my good friend, Marty Dempsey. I, um, <clears throat> I really enjoy college campuses. As you heard, my grandfather was an academician. My father taught part-time at Vassar. He's an architect. He taught architectural design. I went to Morehouse College, and I have two kids in college right now, your age. Um, I always enjoy visiting my two kids in college. I am not subtle when I come to a college campus, unfortunately, though I try hard. The first time I visited 
my son. They both go to college in California. One of the things I enjoy about my motorcade, my entourage, in addition to the United States Secret Service, when I'm in California, I get chips. Chips. Who here remembers the TV show, Chips, from the 70s and the 80s? I get chips. The bikers, they are very, very good at what they do. So, first time I showed up at my son's college campus with the Secret Service, the Black Suburbans, the marked California Highway Patrol, and the bikes, it was not subtle. Imagine what happens when all of that rolling thunder shows up, shows up at a freshman dorm, no notice. You hear lots of toilets flush. Lots of, door, lots of, lots of doors slam. Raid! And then eventually somebody peeks out the door and says, oh, I get it. His dad is here. It's OK. Coast is clear. Now, my daughter, on the other hand, has instructed me when I come to visit her, I am to dial it back as much as possible. Don't embarrass me, Dad. Don't embarrass me. So I tried. We left behind as much of the rolling thunder as we could a block away from the campus of her school. And I went on the campus with the bare minimum of the Secret Service detail. But even that caught the attention of the student body. The Secret Service are conspicuous on a college campus. So that day, when I visited my daughter, I learned about this tool, which many of you know of, called Yik Yak. <laughs> Yik Yak lit up when I set foot on my daughter's college campus. And a lot of chat back and forth between and among the students. For those few who don't know Yik Yak, it's this tool where students on a college campus can talk to one another anonymously about things happening on campus. Yik Yak lit up. First entry. Hey, there are two Secret Service guys on campus. What up? <laughs> and then the reply, Obama is here. <laughs> And then there was a sir reply. Obama's not here. He's not even on the West Coast today. And somebody else pipes in. Malia is here. <laughs> she's looking at us for school. And then somebody says, no, she's too young. My son, who couldn't resist making fun of dad, said, it's Vin Diesel <laughs> with bodyguards. Finally, somebody figured it out. I said, no, it's the fake Obama, Jay Johnson. He's the Homeland Security guy. His daughter goes to school here. So I enjoy college campuses. I enjoy talking to young people about what we do in Homeland Security and national security and what we do in Washington. Frankly, to talk to you in part about a career in public service. I want to encourage the young people here to think about spending some of your time as an adult serving your country, your state, your community. We need good people in public service, particularly in national security, in homeland security, if not in the US military, in civilian life. So I encourage all of you to think about it. I've been a lawyer for 34 years. For 2 thirds of that time, I've been a corporate lawyer. The other third has been in public service, and I will tell you that I have despite the financial sacrifice, found my public service to be the most gratifying part of my adult career. Um, just briefly, and then I'll sit down, and David has some very good questions I know he wants to ask me, and I look forward to that. DHS is the third largest department of our government. It is the newest cabinet-level department of our government, formed after 9-11 in 2002. We, have, we are a large, decentralized, cabinet-level department with 22 components, lots of mission, 226,000 people, a total spending authority of $60 billion. We're responsible for counterterrorism, cybersecurity, aviation security, port security, the enforcement and administration of our immigration laws, maritime security, 
through the Coast Guard, detection of chemical, biological, nuclear threats, protection of our national leaders through the Secret Service, and response to natural disasters through FEMA. We have FEMA, Customs Border Patrol, Immigration Customs Enforcement, Citizenship and Immigration Services, Naturalizations, Visas, TSA, Secret Service, and a number of other agencies. Given that we are the newest cabinet level department, for you political science junkies, you may be interested to know that that makes me the last person in the presidential line of succession. <laughs> there is no one behind me, no one, except maybe the US Army. Um, I take that very seriously. I am the last person in the line of succession. Some of you may have heard during the State of the Union this year, I was the designated successor in an off-site location, undisclosed. So I take my line of succession obligations very, very seriously. Um, <clears throat> I'll say two things. One, since I've been secretary, as General Dempsey alluded to, we spent a lot of time on management reform of the department, getting the Department of Homeland Security to function as a more effective, efficient place through my unity of effort initiative, which we started two years ago. We're eliminating the stovepipes. We're reforming the way in which we hire people, our acquisition process, our budget making, more centralized budget making, fewer stovepipes, a more strategic approach to budgets and acquisitions. We eliminated all of the vacancies in senior level positions. We're raising morale. Uh, we've got a new headquarters we're building, which Congress is fully funded. We'll be uh, ready to move into in 2018, long after I'm gone as secretary. Um, and a number of other things to more effectively and efficient, efficiently deliver homeland security to the American people, which includes not just counterterrorism, but cybersecurity and a bunch of other things. The terrorist threat to our homeland has evolved significantly. Sunday is the 15th anniversary of 9-11. The terrorist threat to our homeland has evolved significantly to a, an environment in which we have to be concerned about not just terrorist-directed attacks, but terrorist-inspired attacks by those who self-radicalize, who are inspired by something they see on the internet put out by the Islamic State or AQ. Makes for a more complicated threat environment. Lone wolves, those who self-radicalize, are difficult to detect. Our intelligence community is challenged. Our law enforcement and homeland security communities are challenged. We're doing a number of things, which we'll talk about, I'm quite sure, to deal with this new and evolving threat. Sunday, I'll celebrate, commemorate 9-11 uh, in New York City. I'm a New Yorker. 9-11 happens to be my birthday. I was in Manhattan on 9-11. Each year, I've spent it at different places. Last year. I went to Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Shanksville was actually the most moving because it was a very elegant monument to the heroism of the passengers on Flight 93 out in the middle of a countryside in a what seems to be totally random, remote, out of the way farmland. But it's emblematic of terrorism in that it can strike almost any place, random, at any time. Uh, like many of you, I remember that day like it was yesterday. I remember the crisp blue sky, the early fall day. I was looking forward to celebrating my birthday that evening, quietly, at home, like I always do. And in a moment, um, peace was shattered and our world changed. Tomorrow, we're going to have a program in New York City to commemorate the U.S. government's return to the World Trade Center. DHS, FEMA, GSA, we've taken space in the new World Trade Center. We're going to have an uplifting ceremony on 9-9 tomorrow in the World Trade Center to mark the U.S. government's return to that site. So the point of that is to say we need to continue to commemorate the heroism and the loss that occurred 15 years ago, but in this country, we're also always looking forward 
we are, more than we appreciate sometimes, a remarkably strong and resilient nation that comes back stronger from tragedy. You look at what happened after the Boston Marathon bombing in 2013. Something like 50% more runners signed up for the marathon in 2014. We are a remarkably resilient country, so, and, and a people. Uh, the other thing I'll say is, sounds like a cliche, but it's so true. Terrorism cannot prevail if we refuse to be terrorized. As the Homeland Security guy, you want to know from me what we are doing to protect you. But the public has a role, not just vigilance, awareness, but terrorism cannot prevail if we refused to retreat to fear, suspicion, intolerance, and prejudice. So, uh, David, I look forward to your questions. And uh, everybody, uh, thanks for the wonderful audience. Uh, it's really impressive to look at everybody up there in the cheap seats. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for, uh, for those kind words and putting us in the proper mood. Uh, you know, before we uh, uh, dive in, uh, these events like this don't happen with a lot of work from a lot of people you know because you have a staff that uh, makes these things happen, and we do uh, here as well. Ours is not as big as yours, I don't think. Uh, but. Uh, I just want to point out, uh, Allie Brewer has been working on making this happen for the last two or three months. And Allie, thank you for everything you've done. Uh, and thank you to all the people at the Sanford School. I see Richard uh, uh, doing the uh, audio and our communications, Mary Lindsley and uh, Karen Kemp and Jackie, the shop there. And uh, thank you for all the uh, security staff as well and, and for your staff, Mr. Secretary, for working uh, with us. And we're also very lucky uh, to have with us, very fortunate, uh, two of North Carolina's public servants. Uh, we have the Secretary of uh, Public Safety, Frank Perry, uh, and the North Carolina uh, Director of Emergency Management, Mike Sprayberry, are here. They did not have a great Labor Day weekend, I don't think, but it may be because the hurricane wasn't as bad. Maybe they got uh, a couple days off. I don't know. But we thank you for all you did and, and for helping us make it through that disaster. And thank you for being here with us, both of you. Um, Mr. Secretary, from just spending an hour, I know you like to look forward, uh, and I want to spend most of our time doing that, but uh, you commented on uh, where you were on 9-11 and, and, and a little bit about what it's meant for our country. Uh, let's, let's uh, and I think it affects our world uh, today very much. You know, President Bush uh, very quickly framed uh, our response uh, to the horrible events as a day as a, as a war on terrorism, as a war on terror, more accurately, and he said it would not end until we uh, uh, eliminated all terrorist organizations of global reach. Um, and I wanted to ask you uh, kind of two, two questions about that. Do you think, given the time and what happened and the magnitude of what happened on 9-11, that that was a, a good way to frame it? And it, has that framing, has that uh, of this, our response, has it stood the test of time? Here we are 15 years later. Uh, are, are we still essentially a nation at war? Well, <clears throat> I am always reluctant to second guess uh, a decision made while I was not in the chair, while I was not around, while I was not in the situation room, prior to my arrival. So much of what we do, so much of our framing, so much of our messaging is based on context and circumstances. I was not in government on 9-11. Um, and so I hesitate to second guess the decisions of those who frame this as a war on terror. I do know that by 2009, when I became general counsel of the Department of Defense and the Obama administration was new, we made a very deliberate decision to not use the generic phrase at that point in our efforts, from my lawyer's perspective, <clears throat> when we engage in armed conflict, we have to assess whether somebody or something is a lawful military objective. And part of that is assessing whether the objective is part of the, that which the Congress has given us authority to go against statutorily. So that framing works much better 
with a more specific notion of who we're at war against, Al-Qaeda, AQAP, the Al-Shabaab, the AQ elements of, of Al-Shabaab, for example. From my lawyer's context, you've got to know who you're at war against, because you, that's how you determine who's a lawful military objective and who is not, versus the more generic <clears throat> notion that we're in armed, armed conflict against a, a, a concept or a or a, 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 a generic enemy out there. So we moved very deliberately away from the war of terror phraseology in 2009. Um, since then, we now have ISIL. And we have, as I referred to, uh, <clears throat> this um, threat of homegrown violent extremism, terrorist-inspired attacks. You cannot deal with homegrown violent extremism through armed conflict. Um, through, through our mechanisms of war because of pasta comitatus and a whole lot of other reasons. So <clears throat> in this environment, I'm not sure that the phraseology of war on terror works well either. This has to be, in the current context, a law enforcement effort. We continue to take the fight overseas militarily there to take the fight to the enemy where they where they headquarters, where they plan, where they train, where they recruit. Um, but there's got to be a domestic law enforcement effort, a domestic aviation security effort, uh, as well as a domestic um, countering violent extremism effort. Uh, that's not armed conflict. That's building bridges, encouraging people, if you see something, say something in our homeland, in our communities. So, David, it's a long way of saying that I hesitate to second guess um, why at the time we chose to frame it the way we did. We now have the benefit of hindsight. Uh, we didn't then. You uh, gave a very thoughtful speech in uh, 2011 at Oxford University, another campus, I guess. 2012. You, uh, oh, excuse yes. me. Uh, and, um, uh, and I think it's also- Because I was going out the door. <laughs> I think it's also very appropriate to reflect on that. Uh, here we are a decade and a half later, because you talked about the dangers of, of essentially getting into the mindset that war, warfare, being a country at war was, you used the term, uh, the new normal. War, you said, must be regarded as finite, extraordinary, and an unnatural state of affairs. But here we are, you know, in recent years uh, with the rise of ISIL, it seems that there's uh, this conflict that came to our shores at 9-11 is really racking even more countries with uh, violence than it had uh, even maybe five years ago. Uh, it doesn't seem that peace is really close to the horizon. So how do we, as a nation, how do we grapple with the, the costs and the mental burden of being a country at war for so long? The, um, <clears throat> the reason I made that point in that speech at the Oxford Union was the rest of the paragraph in that quote, which was that <clears throat> war permits someone, if they are a privileged belligerent, as we refer to members of the armed forces, to kill another man without a trial, without due process, uh, without a hearing. And that should be an unnatural state of affairs. Um, after signing off on a lot of um, military operations myself from the legal perspective, um, I thought it was time to address the uh, prospect of perpetual war so that it does not become the new normal. What I was really saying in that speech, however, if 80% of that speech was explaining the legal architecture for our counterterrorism efforts. And the point of the speech was to say that there will come a time and should come a time when we have to acknowledge that the war against Al Qaeda that the Congress authorized in 2001 has come to an end. And <clears throat> that does not preclude that there'd be another enemy out there called ISIL. The lawyers now take the view, and I don't want to get into being a lawyer again, that ISIL used to be AQI, AQI is an offshoot of AQ, and therefore we have legal authority to do what we're doing, pursuant to the original authorization in 2001. 
at the Kevin Bacon, eight degrees of separation uh, authorization for your uh, I can't say. Okay. I'm out of the Just legal check. business now. Um, but the point of the speech was to explain the legal architecture for our efforts and to say that this should not go on forever under the 2001 authorization. We're in a very different place right now um, with the new environment that, I, that I've talked about, which requires a whole of government effort. It's not just the military, it's law enforcement, it's homeland security, public involvement as well. Uh, I fear that um, this, will be, this will not end tomorrow. Uh, it's going to continue to require a sustained effort uh, going forward as it evolves to what we see today. Well, uh, the next, uh, we have the 9-11 anniversary. We also have an election on the horizon. We're not going to get into politics and the candidates, but uh, I think it is a matter of homeland security to some degree that uh, at least it has been reported that uh, there has been an effort from abroad to interfere with the election. And I know you've commented to some degree uh, looking at the, our election infrastructure. Uh, what can you say about uh, steps the department or other entities in the government are taking to make sure that our election infrastructure is safe and, and secure? Cybersecurity is part of DHS's missions, um, and cybersecurity involves working with the private sector, working with state governments, working with other federal agencies to help them secure their own networks. And so, Essentially, what we do in DHS is we're a service provider, if you ask. Uh, we don't regulate the private sector. We don't regulate state and local governments, particularly elections, election systems. That is the province of state and local governments. So in the current environment, which involves increasing sophistication among a range of cyber bad actors, not just nation states, but also hacktivists, criminals, um, I have been on a campaign to raise awareness among state election officials about what we can offer by way of services. And what we offer is um, vulnerability assessments, um, information sharing about the threat environment, uh, best practices. We can do in-house vulnerability assessments. We can do them from our headquarters if there's an internet presence for state election officials. And so I've been encouraging state officials to ask for our help. And you ask, we can provide in the short term and in the longer term. And we do this for the private sector all the time. We do this for very, very sophisticated sectors of, of private life, the financial services sector, uh, energy, agriculture, utilities. We're offering the same thing to state election officials um, because we want to be sure that they are protected. It would be very difficult, in my judgment, for a bad cyber actor to alter an election count, just given how decentralized our system is, how complex it is. Um, but a lot of election officials have a presence on the internet, um, whether it's voter registration or information, public affairs, and so we, we're offering to state election officials now uh, our services, but they, you know, should they decide to, to come to us and accept it. Thank you. There's uh, this notion that we want to somehow take over the election. Or that I want to that's not the, true? No, I don't have the authority to do that, <laughs> uh, nor do I have the desire. Um, we offer our services, we offer our, our help, and um, that's what we've been doing. Okay, so immigration is a huge uh, issue in this election. It's a huge in uh, issue in society uh, and a big part of your job. And given uh, the, the conversation and, and rhetoric we've had around immigration, I want to start from the most basic principles. And, and, what, and, and that is, is immigration good for America? Yes. We are a nation of immigrants, with the exception of Native Americans and the possible exception of my slave ancestors who were brought here, all the rest of us are immigrants. Part of my ancestry is an immigrant ancestry. So we are a nation of immigrants. Um, from the economic standpoint, 
Um, economists, by and large, agree that immigration promotes the economy. I'm told that 28% of new businesses in this country are established by immigrants, and that immigration has actually helped boost the wages even of native workers um, because of the entrepreneurship and the ingenuity of, of immigrants. Um, so um, it, it is con conventionally, conventional wisdom that immigration is, is, is good for the country, it's good for the economy, and it's who we are as a nation. Um, you look at so many immigrants, even first generation immigrants who have contributed to the wealth and talent of this country. Uh, so uh, is that a tough case to make to you know, maybe a, a room full of folks who are, are having trouble uh, finding a job or uh, who are on economic hard times and say, why should we be letting other people, non-Americans, uh, come in when they're, the economic uh, prosperity is On first blush, I suspect it is, yes. Um, but when you look at the facts, you look at the data, um, you see that immigration um, is a general boost to our economy. You look at places that have high unemployment rates, for example. Um, mayors in those cities are actively trying to recruit immigrants to come to their cities to help start business, boost the economy, boost business. Dayton, Ohio is a city that I know well. I have, for years I had an aunt and uncle live in Dayton, Ohio. They moved there in the 40s during the auto industry and I've, I've seen Dayton kind of rise and fall and the mayor of Dayton is actively recruiting immigrants to come to that community. Same thing in Detroit. Okay. So illegal immigration is a big part of your job uh, as well, and you talked about uh, uh, trying to get the facts out there. Um, what, what do we actually know about illegal immigration? Is it up or is it down? I've always kind of wondered, sometimes you hear people get up, they say, you know, we know there are 700 people crossing the border illegally every day, and I kind of wonder if we could count them, uh, why couldn't we stop them? Uh, <laughs> So what are, the, what are the facts that we really know about uh, the population that is here and, uh, and how much illegal immigration is actually current? Where do I begin? Um, first, to your point, there was a Pew Research survey done a couple of years ago of Americans that asked the question, is illegal immigration, hello, is illegal immigration better or worse today than it was 10 years ago, and 55% of Americans said they thought it was worse today. The reality is that it's much better in terms of the number of those apprehended on our southwest border. It has gone down significantly. In the year 2000, 1.6 million people were apprehended on our southern border from Mexico and other points south, 1.6 million, and apprehensions are an indicator of total attempts to cross the border illegally. Apprehensions are the surest indicator we have right now. We're building metrics to try to measure total attempts, um, but apprehensions are the surest indicator. And the number of apprehensions has gone down significantly. Last fiscal year, compared to 1.6 million 15 years ago, last fiscal year, the number was 331,000, a fraction of what it used to be. Two years ago, because we had the spike with the kids from Central America, it went up to 479,000, still a fraction of what it used to be. This year, I suspect it'll be higher than last year, um, somewhere around 400,000 or so, maybe a little more than that. That is the result of investments we have made in border security over the last 15 years. There is a wall. We built a wall consistent with a congressional mandate to build a wall or a fence in places where it makes sense to do so. In urban areas along the border, um, there's no wall along the windy Rio Grande in the Rio Grande Valley, nor is there a wall on top of a 10,000 foot mountain in a desert. That would not be a wise investment in taxpayer money to build a wall across the entire southwest border. Um, and if you, you have to look at what motivates migration. If somebody is motivated enough, a seven-year-old child, 
for example, like some seven-year-old children I have actually encountered in Texas. If a seven-year-old or 17-year-old is motivated enough to leave Central America, travel the entire distance of Mexico, and climb a 10,000-foot mountain, they're not going to be deterred by a 10-foot wall. Or as my predecessor used to say, build a 10-foot wall, and I'll show you an 11-foot ladder. So, so that's, that's the reality. And so we have a wall or fence in places where it makes sense to do that. We've also invested, and we continue to invest, in surveillance technology, communications, aerial surveillance, uh, vehicles, boats, and so forth. And that has led to an overall decrease in apprehensions and total illegal immigration. Now, the push factors that exist, the poverty, the violence in Central America and other places continues. And that's why we need to invest in Central America and we need to invest in alternate safe legal paths to come to the United States, to petition to come to the United States and, and other countries. Um, and if we don't do, it, if we don't do that, um, <clears throat> this would not, there's not enough border security in the world to prevent illegal immigration. Well, let me see if I can anticipate a question that is fueling our, the protests and try to do this in an orderly uh, fashion. There was a big influx of uh, many people, a lot of children from Central America a number of years ago. Uh, uh, and uh, many of them have been settled and are been admitted uh, while there are questions about the status of uh, uh, many others. Um, maybe you could say what, what the department, uh, the position the government has taken on this issue and uh, uh, what the government is doing. Well, we, we simply do not have open borders. And we have an obligation to enforce the law consistent with our priorities for how we enforce the law. There are people that don't like that. There are people who feel very strongly about that. Uh, but we do not have open borders in this country. So we have prioritized essentially two things pursuant to the priorities I announced in November 2014. One, convicted criminals, threats to public safety. We prioritized the removal of those people, but also people who are apprehended at our border. Um, we cannot simply let people pass through and claim to have any type of border security. So consistent with our laws and the processes we have, if you're apprehended at the border or you're a threat to public safety, uh, we have to send you back consistent with the process we have. That gives people an opportunity to apply for asylum, to go through our appellate process. But if you are ordered removed by an immigration court and you've exhausted your appeals and there's no claim of asylum that has that is still pending, we have to send you home. We have to, send, we have to enforce the laws consistent with our priorities. So, and so the, the Duke, Hello. we will have a chance for public to ask questions at the end. Excuse me, excuse me. The secretary, I, I actually uh, asked the secretary to address this issue. It wasn't something I was going to discuss, but since there was uh, a protest and we're a university, I asked the secretary to address that question. He gave a fair answer. Uh, if you, you might not agree with the answer, but uh, uh, if everybody had a chance to shout and ask exactly what was on their mind, we wouldn't be able to have a program today. So I think we've dealt with the issue fairly. We've kind of discussed the pushback to some of immigration policies from one direction. On the other direction, you get pushed in the other direction, and people would say, you know what, we have enough laws. The laws are on the books that say that people who are here illegally uh, must leave. If we just enforced all the laws, uh, then we wouldn't have uh, uh, illegal immigrants in the country. Uh, you're the <coughs> chief law uh, immigration enforcer. Uh, in, our, in our government. So how, how do you respond to that? People say, you're not doing your job because uh, uh, we're not enforcing the law and trying well, to get... Well, first, um, you know, the 
after we do our Q&A, I'm happy to take questions from the audience, uh, including Mr. Acosta. Uh, I'm also happy to meet with you in private after this meeting, if you'd like. Um, <clears throat> immigration is, is, it is without a doubt an extraordinarily difficult emotional thing. It is the most difficult emotional issue I've dealt with in public service, and I've dealt with a lot of them. You've heard about some of them, including law of armed conflict, counterterrorism, targeted lethal force, gays in the military. Um, it's a very difficult subject. Um, people believe the world is flat. People believe the world is round, and there are very few people in between from which you can find common ground. <clears throat> do, I, do I like sending somebody back? to Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador? No, uh, but I have an obligation to enforce the law. Um, as long as the law requires that we enforce border security and we enforce our immigration laws consistent with our priorities. Uh, that is not a pleasant job, always. I have spent hours with literally hundreds of children coming from Central America at holding centers in South Texas uh, I have encountered pregnant 15-year-old girls uh, who made the dangerous journey, and it breaks my heart. Um, I would like to, on a human level, embrace them all and take them home with me, but I know I can't do that. Um, when I signed up for this job, I signed up for an obligation to enforce the law consistent with our priorities, and we do our best to do so in a humane manner. Uh, do we always get it right? No. Do we always get it perfect? No. Um, and there's plenty of people who are always ready to uh, criticize um, and point out our flaws. Um, <clears throat> and I don't have an issue with the banners. Um, you're exercising your First Amendment rights on an academic institution. This is a public event, and so you have a right to be here. And I salute your, uh, the energy with which, and the courage which with, with which you, you come here tonight. Um, I tell my own kids, I hope you feel as strongly about issues as some of the people I've encountered here. So um, it's not easy, um, but it's part of what we, it's part of the responsibility one has in public service. There are a range of factors and considerations that go into public policy, government decision making. One of them, has always got to be the humanitarian dimension. Uh, one of them's always got to be what your heart tells you is the right thing. Um, but very often, doing the right thing is, is complicated and multi-dimensional, so. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, let's turn a little bit about to the terrorist threat, which we, where you started. Uh, it does seem like ISIS is beginning, at least, to lose its grip on what it calls the caliphate, this territory in Syria and uh, Iraq. Uh, and a lot of experts, probably many in your department, uh, feel that as they lose their grip, they're going to become more of a traditional terrorist organization, that they seem to have built capabilities, well-financed capabilities to execute uh, attacks uh, abroad. Uh, and there's some irony in that the more successful we are, in some ways we m might be increasing the threat to the homeland. Uh, so I guess uh, as we enter this phase, what is your department doing uh, uh, to anticipate uh, the, the, this possibility? You can kill an enemy, you can capture an enemy, and not defeat an enemy. And so <clears throat> in this new phase we're in, we have to be concerned about what is happening here in the homeland, um, the possibilities that terrorist organizations can reach into our homeland through the internet through their recruitment efforts, which they are actively engaged in right now, which is why, in my judgment, it is so important that we build bridges to communities that terrorist organizations are trying to target. Uh, and that includes American Muslim communities. And I use the phrase in plural very deliberately because Islam is as diverse as Christianity. Um, Somali Americans in Minneapolis are very different from Syrian Americans in Houston or Pakistani Americans in, in Framingham, Mass. And so 
As Secretary of Homeland Security, I've made a priority to engage American Muslim communities around this country. My goal is to reach every major metropolitan area that has a significant American Muslim community in it. I think I'm about there. I was the first cabinet officer uh, and the most senior US government official to address the Islamic Society of North America, which is an annual convention in Chicago. Um, supposedly there were 10,000 American Muslims there, and I thought it was essential to engage and speak to that audience, which is what we did last weekend. Um, it was controversial to do so in some quarters, but I think, it, I think that kind of outreach is essential in the current environment, and I'm hoping that the next Secretary of Homeland Security um, of whatever political stripe continues that effort. Well, this is an area I've studied a lot, as you know, and I've spoken to a lot of Muslim uh, American audiences. I'm sure you've heard uh, this uh, criticism, and which is of this effort, which has this acronym CVE and the government countering violent extremism uh, and other initiatives. And you talk to uh, these folks, and they say, you know, we feel like we're being in some ways singled out for having to a special burden placed on us to try to deal with this particular form of violent extremism, where there are other forms of violent extremism. We saw. Uh, in Dallas and the, the, uh, the attack against the police office that is there. Uh, we saw it in Charleston. Uh, yet there's no special program uh, to reach out to these other communities and try to place this obligation on them to address those forms of extremism. And they say that this is a, a double standard, unfair. How, how do you, when you talk to folks, uh, what do you say about that? A, a couple of things. One, in our efforts, we are focused on the communities that are being targeted by terrorist organizations, so that's number one. And that happens to be most often American Muslim communities in terms of countering the message, the recruitment message of ISIL and AQ. Number two, <clears throat> when you're talking about domestic extremist groups, uh, domestic terrorists, um, fundamentally that's a different kind of mission. Um, most violent domestic terrorists don't want to sit down with me in a community roundtable. It's the nature of things. However, patriotic, honest American Muslims do to help us help them in their own efforts locally. So that's what we've been doing. Um, I have heard that very message. You know, why are you targeting us? Um, and so. My, the, my message last weekend in Chicago was not to simply say, please encourage your youth what not to become. My message last week was a very different message, which was <clears throat> tell your youth and to the youth who were present, in this country, this is what you can become. And I'm a student of history, so I like to point to history. And it's fundamental, and this is how we started the discussion about immigration. Uh, we are an immigrant country, and wave after wave after wave of immigrant communities have come to this country seeking uh, full acceptance into the fabric of our society. And you look at Italian Americans, Catholics, Mormons, Jewish Americans, Irish Americans, African Americans, Hispanics, wave after wave. And so my message in Chicago was a positive one, an encouraging one, hopefully. And I drew from the lessons of history. General Dempsey talked about my grandfather, who was the son of a slave, who was a sociologist. He wrote a lot. Um, he wrote a lot about civil rights in the late 1940s, early 1950s. And for his scholarship was called before the House Un-American Activities Committee to deny he was a member of the Communist Party because of the suspicion that surrounded, at the time of McCarthyism, intelligent, educated African Americans who wanted change. And so my own grandfather had to testify in what was likely the very same room I testify in for the House Homeland Security Committee to deny he was a member of the Communist Party and to give, a, give testimony about the patriotism 
of African Americans at the time because of their military service and other things, which sounds very reminiscent to the debate going on right now about American Muslims, um, where they, have, they feel obliged to point to the headstones of Muslim Americans at Arlington Cemetery, or you have to see the gold star mother and father come before a national political convention to point out that yes, there are American Muslims who have died serving this country. So much of history tends to be cyclical. Yeah, I wanted to, since I addressed one side of the coin, I wanted to address the other because we have, uh, uh, again, talked to a lot of Muslim Americans uh, myself. And uh, I, I'm sure you hear this, Mr. Secretary, but I think it's good for the audience to hear as well. You hear about parents who say their kids are being bullied at school for years. Uh, you have women who wear the veil, who uh, everything was fine, and even uh, 10 years after 9-11, but since ISIS, uh, uh, they are discriminated against at work. They are called things walking down the street. Uh, here, in my hometown, Chapel Hill, 10 miles from here, we had a triple murder of three beautiful Muslim students, same age as uh, some of the folks in this audience. Uh, the FBI somehow concluded it was not a hate crime in less than, uh, less than 24 hours. Um, so I wanted to ask you, you know, to reflect, what, what is happening in our country in, in this 15 years uh, where you know, we, we really have done a great job, your department. Uh, we've had uh, the level of violence that's been happening inside the US, uh, the number of homicides linked to Al Qaeda and ISIS is less than two months of what's happened in the homicides in the city of Chicago, uh, and, and that's over 15 years. So what's happening to our, our national fabric that, uh, that this, is, this is happening? Uh, and nobody feels comfortable with it, but I think it's important to talk about. That's a big question. Um, let me try to answer it. First, very plainly, the incidents of discrimination, vilification, abuse toward American Muslims um, is high and it goes up and spikes after a terrorist incident. In schools, on the streets, in places of worship, this is what they face. Uh, bullying of kids and so forth. So part of my message and I think part of the message of state government, local government, local law enforcement, uh, US government is um, we stand with the victims of discrimination, vilification, um, bullying, um, and, and so forth. And that was part of the reason I went to Chicago last weekend. Um, terrorism, I mean, you're correct to point out the statistics. <clears throat> My job as Secretary of Homeland Security is not so much to point out that terrorism, victims of terrorism, numerically pale in comparison to the victims of, of domestic gun violence, though it's a fact, people want to know from the Homeland Security official of this government what we are doing to keep the homeland safe from terrorism, from cyber attacks. And so my message continually is here are all the things that we are doing to keep you safe, to keep the, the public safe, your family safe through border security, cybersecurity, counterterrorism, CVE, and, and, and so forth. So that's my job and that's part of my message, um, notwithstanding everything you have cited. Um, I think people at one level or another understand the phenomenon you, you refer to, but they want to know from me that we're doing our best across the entire national security, homeland security, law enforcement communities of our government to keep the American people safe. And I assure you that there are a lot of people working very hard over time who do it well to, to fulfill that mission. It is the most important mission that the US government has. The one other point I'll make, which is not exactly responsive to your question, but I'll make it anyway, is that in our world, Homeland Security, we're always on defense. And you don't always hear about the good news of the defensive team. Good news in our world is a very often no news. Uh, if you have a successful national political convention or a successful papal visit, 
or a successful presidential visit on the other side of the planet, people don't always hear about the things we prevented from happening, the people who were prevented from breaching the gate, uh, who were dangerous. Um, press doesn't always cover that. But that is the product of a lot of hard work, professionalism, uh, perfection, and precision by your homeland security community that work for you and serve the public. All right. Uh, we are going to move to uh, questions from the audience. Uh, we have, um, Mr. Secretary, you can uh, point out folks. Ali will uh, uh, bring them the microphone, and uh, we have some time for that. So it's going to be down this floor, right? And, oh, and who's up there? Uh, Lauren uh, is waving. See a lot There's of a microphone there. OK. All right. Let me start right here. Yes, sir. Well, nice and loud. Well, wait for Ali to bring the microphone over so everybody can hear you. Thank you very much. Could you give us your thoughts on recent efforts such as that of Jigsaw to rearrange YouTube results, specifically in this case, to combat ISIS by showing people different things using the internet than they would find otherwise? So specifically, the use of technology in ways to combat terrorism that by private companies like that? Um, I have to say that I don't know enough about the case to, to comment intelligently, so I better not speculate, sorry. Okay. Okay, right here. Right over there. Mr. Secretary, I was wondering if you could speak to what your department in particular has done with uh, recent changes in that the likelihood of an American dying through a terrorist attack is down to one in 56 million, as uh, the professor touched on, which is quite low, which of course speaks to the success of your department, but also in sort of in its connection to the revelations by recent whistleblowers any government has to balance security and freedom. And it looks just from the statistics that we're doing pretty well with security, but can you comment on how we're doing with the freedom? That's a good question. And as I said to a group of students earlier today, the essence of what we do, what I do, is to find the right balance between basic physical security and freedom. And the things that we Americans cherish and expect in a free and open society. Freedom to associate, freedom to travel, free speech, freedom of religion. Um, these are things that we cherish in society and we do not want to give up. And so finding the right balance between that and security is actually the essence of my job. And I view those of us in Homeland Security and National Security as the guardians of both. So very often when we hear about a new threat stream, let's say in aviation security. First, first impulse is to say, we have to ban that completely from all flights. That's not necessarily the best impulse. That could be an overreaction. I could guarantee you a perfectly safe commercial flight tomorrow, but you would not be wearing any clothes. <laughs> you would not have any food. You would not be allowed to get up and go to the bathroom. You would have no carry-on and no check luggage, but you would be very safe. Um, just like I could guarantee you a perfectly safe email system, but you'd be limited to conversations with about six people right here. No, ac no access to the outside internet, but people want access to the internet, and that includes risk. There is risk in much of what we do in a free and democratic society. We are not a police state. Every once in a while, the public will accept and expect a recalibration of where that balance is based on the security environment. But the challenge for, for us in government, in national security, is to not overreact one way or another um, so that we do harm to that, to that balance. But that's the essence of, of what we do. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, well, we're gonna, oh. Good evening, Secretary. Thank you so much for being here. Um, my question is within the context of um, the 1033 program that authorizes military resources for local police departments. 
um, and President Obama's reform of that. My question is, um, is it ever okay for the police to militarize or for the military to police? Uh, are, in, in, uh, are there times when um, it is appropriate? And what would you say um, uh, about the, their encroaching upon each other's duties? Are there lessons that can be learned from each other in doing so? It, good question. It depends on what we're talking about. Uh, I do believe that there is risk in an in-your-face military-style military approach to a civilian community. There is risk to that. There is risk of confrontation, overreaction. And let me talk about what we do in Homeland Security. We actually have a huge, huge grant-making function to state and local jurisdictions state law enforcement, local law enforcement, local first responders. We provide hundreds of millions of dollars a year in grant money for things like communications equipment, um, surveillance equipment, first responder equipment, um, things to protect the first responder, things to protect the victims of violence, the victims of an accident. Um, so very often I will go to a, a police station, uh, one police plaza in New York City or Louisville, Kentucky or Miami-Dade, and I get into an op center and the police chief says, you paid for that, you paid for that, you paid for that, you paid for that. And these are all good things. The Super Bowl, uh, when I go to the op center at a Super Bowl, um, there are things that DHS has paid for to contribute to the security of the Super Bowl. So I'm very much a big believer in the U.S. government's support for things to help with homeland security, hometown security, such as surveillance equipment, first responder equipment, um, communications equipment, active shooter training exercises. Uh, but I think we, we do recognize that you can over-militarize domestic security to a point where it is counterproductive. But for the most part, what we fund it are things to aid the first responder, the cop on the beat, to basically do their job, keep themselves safe, and keep the public safe. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, the president's budget uh, this year cut the state homeland security grants funding pretty severely. Yes, the Congress is putting it back. back. By, the, by the Congress. And so I'd like to understand why that might be happening. And the second question is, is we've also heard that maybe there's some consideration Um, second question first, um, no. Um, FEMA needs to belong someplace in a cabinet level department. FEMA, as I'm sure you know, has come a long way in the last 11 years since Katrina. I go to disaster recovery scenes, situations, and I leave there and people tell me this is what the federal government actually does best now. Through the leadership of Craig Fugate, FEMA has come a long way, and we are interconnected with FEMA now in DHS in a way it would be counterproductive to carve them out and have them out there free floating. Um, <clears throat> you are correct that in the President's budget submission, grants were dramatically cut, but Congress put it back. Um, we have to meet the budget caps that Congress set for us, which means priorities and choices. I personally am a big believer in grants for the reasons I just explained. I've seen them at work. I've seen the uses that are made of our grant money. I'm a huge supporter of grants to North Carolina, New York, Kentucky, uh, California, Arizona. Uh, given how the homeland security threat has evolved, we have to depend on state and local law enforcement, homeland security, first responders, much more so to deal with homegrown violent extremism, uh, lone wolf attacks. Um, it's very often, because the federal government is not everywhere. Um, you guys in state and local are much more, have much more of a presence in the communities that we have to protect. Well, thank you for your support on that. You said it would put it to good use. Okay, we have time for one more question. Um, yes, ma'am, right here. I can hear you. <laughs> um, it's great. I love 
love hearing you say the don't uh, or see something, say something, be vigilant. My son is a new Durham police officer. He's trying to be very vigilant. But tell your son I said thank you for his public service. If you see something, say something means suspicious behavior and not suspicious people necessarily. And so what we talk about when we talk about public awareness and public vigilance, there are signs of suspicious behavior. There are signs of self-radicalization. Um, when someone self-radicalizes, there is almost always somebody who sees the signs, a family member. And so we encourage people, if you see suspicious behavior, say something. And not a profile based on someone's skin color, someone's attire, someone's accent, uh, but suspicious behavior. There are definite signs. Uh, I believe that if you go to various different websites, you can see them, learn from them, and identify them. Now, the specific instance you're talking about um, with the homemade device, um, you know, a device with, I mean, I'm not going to second guess whoever it was that, that uh, prevented the young man from entering, I think, the White House with a device that looked like it looked. No, he's at school. But, at school, he's okay, school. sorry. He eventually okay, I'm thinking of something else, sorry. Um, I, I'm not in a position to second guess the judgment made at the time, and I, I don't think I will. Someone's obviously doing their best for public safety. I think it's, <clears throat> uh, I'm always reluctant to second guess a decision like that on the ground. Um, so, but it's based on, if you see something, say something is based on suspicious behavior. And there are discernible signs of suspicious behavior that we can all learn from. Well, okay. Mr. Secretary, uh, uh, I did read the entire Oxford Union speech, and I was struck with another passage that I'd like to share uh, with everyone as we close this evening. And you said, uh, you talked about peace, and you talked about peace as the norm towards which the human race constantly strives. And it seems like through all of your public service, whether it be in the Department of Defense or as a U.S. Attorney, Assistant U.S. Attorney, and now trying to keep the homeland safe, that is a a code and an idea that you keep coming back to. So we want to thank you here for visiting Duke. We want to thank you for your public service. And uh, thank you for being an advocate for peace. Thank you very much. job uh, is, and when we say this is a small token of our appreciation, it is a genuinely small token. It falls very well below the gift band, but it is the uh, Duke American Grand Strategy t-shirt, oh, which I hope you, you wear thank uh, you. with great pride. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you all very much. To the students, good luck in your studies. Keep up the good work. Thank you.